Sex segregation at public events makes a comeback in the current year. Well, no, actually, next year. But only if it's women only. Heaven forbid you try to have a male only event. That would be patriarchy, of course. Meanwhile, academic leftists in Sweden have decided that it is imperative for kindergarten children to learn that a horse can be a dog. You see, that's gender diversity. Also in Sweden, referring to God as a he is soon to become haram, well, at least in the Church of Sweden. In other news, more, ch more children's fairy tales are to be included in the list of problematic stories in the leftist church, otherwise known as the education system. I wonder when they'll start publishing their own version of Index Librorum Prohibitorum, or maybe they'll call it uh, the Index Trigorum Prohibitorum. <laughs> Finally, in other news, Girl Scouts is uh, advising teaching girls to be decent and socially... Uh, is advising against teaching girls to be decent and socially functional humans. Apparently that's bad, because rape or something. I wish I were joking. So these are our stories on Periodic Insanity. Hello everyone, and welcome to the 15th edition of Periodic Insanity. Catching up with all the lost time turns out to be much more complicated than I previously thought, but that's because it was also a particularly crowded period, and also because I stumbled upon um, first world problem for creators. I also told you this in the last uh, episode. <clears throat> but then again, I would rather have this problem and be work a little bit more than the opposite of it. Also, I would rather not make a video than make it superficially and rushed. Anyway, with that said, let's dive in, because there's quite a bit to go through. Alright, so the first piece of news is religious insanity, or dare I say, heresy. Mind you, I'm an atheist, but even I believe this is unacceptable heresy. Coming from Sutsvenska, hard battle is expected concerning the new church handbook. It goes like this, quote, the Church of Sweden faces its toughest battle for a long time when deciding on a new church handbook. The criticism of the proposal has been devastating in several ways, and there is talk in several corners about the division of the Church of Sweden. The question of whether God is a he continues to play a central role. The church handbook can be, set, uh, uh, to set the can be said to set the framework and guidelines for the worship service in language, liturgy, theology, and music. The decision to revise the 1986 church guide was made in 2009, but the way up to the present day has been, let's say, uneasy. It is not uncommon for a radical innovation to create tensions in such a tradition-based organization. There has been tough criticism that the st uh, steering committee that drafted the proposal has not listened to all of the objections raised over the years. Many church musicians have been upset and felt insulted. Many priests have stated that they do not recognize themselves in the new language which, according to the objective, will become more inclusive. It is about the view of God, which is not unnecessarily given masculine form, a question this, and it's a question discussed for decades, <laughs> literally debating the gender of the angels here. A more inclusive language can lead to excessive simplification, pointed out, among other things, the Swedish Academy in its reply. Perhaps the religious language must be allowed to be initially as puzzling as the literary language. The one who first reads a significant poem is often initially disoriented, but this is entirely in order. Why should one's contact with the New Testament not obey the same trend? Mikael Löwegen, commissioner in a small land, Lyngby, is critical on two points. The first is that the proposal's aim to increase diversity makes the manual sprawling. There are so many alternative uh, and optional variants that it will be hard to claim that it is the same worship service celebrated in the different parishes. Assuming this proposal, the Swedish church has ceased to exist as a coherent spiritual community, he says to TT. The second point concerns the language that many consider basic. In the proposal, masculine uh, forms are uh, pronounced as he or, or lord in favor of the more neutral god. The, the most basic Christian confession to a, tr to a 
uh, Trinity God, like the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and to Christ as true God and true human incarnation, <clears throat> the, all of these are being are going away, points out Löwengen. I mean, <clears throat> some of these variants flagrantly deviate from the great tra church tradition and the ecumenical consensus that exists between all majors, major Christian churches. However, the proposal has many backers, and during Wednesday, a number of the 52 motions that have been submitted to the church meeting in Uppsala on the proposal are, will be addressed. On Thursday, the final motion will be dealt with, including one that denies, uh, uh, that concerns the, the rejection of the entire handbook proposal. Thereafter, a press conference will be held with, among others, the Archbishop's, uh, Archbishop Antje Jakelen who is, by the way, not even born in Sweden, which apparently is a reason for pride to have your church led by a foreign-born woman. Now you tell me, how is this not heresy? And by the way, the proposal did pass uh, since, I, uh, since this article was um, published. Meanwhile, uh, the proposal did pass. I mean... There is a running joke in Sweden that if uh, Svenska Kyrkan, or the uh, Church of Sweden, had been a company, it would have long been shut down by a court of law, because it could have been sued for fraudulent advertising, as the church has long ceased to be either Swedish or a church to begin with. And that's kind of true. Militant lesbian feminists have held a high position in the church, and their Service is so far away from Christianity that if American leftists were to see it, even they would agree that it's total heresy. Now, I don't know to, uh, how to even explain what Church of Sweden is anymore. <laughs> anyway, uh, it, as explained in the video about ideas and consequences, these kinds of inclusive innovations, or utter insanity, depending on your point of view, do have consequences. Now, the pushers for these innovations think the consequences will be more inclusivity and tolerance. The problem is that they're wrong. The consequences will be the same as the consequences of previous innovations. More people leaving the church and joining more traditional churches that still bear some semblance to the real deal. Officially, the Church of Sweden still cites as having about 6.1 million members, which is a bit over 60% of Sweden's population. But if you believe that, I have a bridge to sell to you. In reality, Church of Sweden is the only religious affiliation that is decreasing in Sweden. All of the others, including but not limited to Islam, Catholicism, Eastern Orthodox Christianity and Atheism, are growing. And while the growth of Islam and Eastern Orthodox Christianity is mostly due to immigration, I mean the largest Orthodox community in Sweden is the Syrian Orthodox Christian community, the growth of Catholicism and Atheism comes mainly from people leaving the Church of Sweden. How can one fail that much and still not realizing it is, quite frankly, beyond me. Although I think they do know, they just don't care because they adhere to secular leftism as their religion. The Church of the Holy State, as my good friend Paul said in one of those videos we made while in Sweden. <laughs> Complete madness. All right, let's move on to another story from Sweden. Coming from Sveriges Televihun. Festival without men in Göteborg, or Gothenburg in English, and goes like this, quote, it has been decided at Emma Nukar's festival for women, transgender and non-binary people to be held in Gothenburg at Bananpiren. After several sexual misconduct events at various festivals in Sweden, Emma Nukar launched her controversial idea of holding a festival without men. Now it is decided that the festival will take place in the last weekend of August at Bananpiren in Gothenburg. Why Gothenburg, reporter asks. Well, to me, of course, uh, it's the best place on earth, and also the place I happen to live, says festival organizer Emma Nukare, on a train heading towards the capital for a meeting with the rest of the festival gang. We have had a, a short time to set up the festival for just one year, so we agree that we need a place where we do not need to build uh, a camp and draw electricity and so on. The Banan Piran is also completely damn perfect, because there is the possibility of having indoor and outdoor scenes. We know that in Gothenburg, you cannot rely on the weather, says Emma Nikkare. As a Gothenburgian, uh, it, is also, it is so difficult not to comment on the name of the festival. The Bananpiren or the Banana Spirits? 
we have been thinking about it. Oh, what will people say about this? There is something there, you know, banana, man, penis. Maybe no, no one will forget it. Close quote. First of all, I am saddened that they decided to put it in late August. Couldn't they have put it in early September or in July? Because when I first read about this, I said uh, on my weekly Friday podcast with AVFM that if I have the time, I'll go there and say I identify as non-binary and just troll the hell out of them. Sadly, in that period of August, I'm not even on the same continent. More on that in January the 1st when I'll announce the schedule for the next year. Oh gosh, the next year <laughs> will be damn crowded with traveling, but you love it. Besides, building and extending this channel's network does not come um, uh, and cannot come just by me staying here and speaking to a camera, well, to two cameras. Real life meetings do help quite a lot. Anyway, with that aside, now that I know that I can't attend the festival, I'll be looking for volunteers to file complaints against this festival with the discriminating Zombitsmanen. Because why not? I also have to uh, look up to see if we can get the European Court of Human Rights involved in this too. The purpose, of course, is not to get them to admit men. I could not care less about their disdainful festival. The purpose is to expand the concept and bring back male-only spaces, as explained in the Freedom of Association video, which I urge you to watch in case you haven't done so already. This needs to be fought tooth and nail, not for the right of men to attend that festival, it's going to be crap anyway, but for the right of everyone else to associate freely however those individuals deem fit, by religion, by interests, and yes, by sex, there's nothing wrong with that. These kinds of events need to be exploited for the benefit of our ideas, but using their tools, and then use negotiation. Now, I'm not saying it will necessarily work, but building up uh, over time a track record that ever, every time they do this, some of our people will show up with a carrot and a stick will change things over time. The carrot is this. Look, you can have your women-only festival, good luck with that, but we also want our men-only spaces. And the stick is easy. If we can't have our male-only spaces, then we will fight the very existence of your events tooth and nail forever and ever till the end of times in every bureaucracy and in every single election campaign until you either stop doing it or you come to our agreement and everyone is freer at the end of it. This is a very good opportunity to put this in practice. Now, of course, I can't do this all myself, I'll need help, but we have to try. <sighs> All right, staying in the realm of sexual politics and in Sweden, coming from uh, also from SVT, picture book uh, on gender diversity for the youngest. It goes like this, quote, Now there is a picture book about gender diversity for the very youngest of children. It, it, in it, there is presented a horse who wants to be a dog and a house husband dressed uh, in a dress. I wish children already understand that they may be who they want, says Suzanne Pelger, author of the book. In her, book uh, in, in her work as a lecturer at Lund University, Suzanne Pelger has met several students who have undergone gender correction. They have been uh, open about it, but there are certainly many who go on secret, she believes. Feeling odd, not fitting into the norm, easily creates a feeling of loneliness and insecurity. That's why she wants small children to see that a costume-dressed man after work can very well change her dress and paint her lips blonde, blonde pink, as Husse does in the book Heston and Husse. In your home, there is also a horse that has chosen to be a dog and therefore joins, chases cats and, li and licks legs. From this, it is then explained uh, that uh, everyone is not either a boy or a girl, points out Suzanne Pelger, a PhD in genetics and biology and a teacher of mathematics. It's not that simple. Just beca because you have an XS or an XY uh, chromosome, the gender is not determined. There are other variants. Hormones play the role and the environment as well as personality. It is very complex. The book was recently published, but some groups uh, of preschool children uh, have already used it. The pictures usually start meaningful discussions, says Suzanne Pelger. Can uncles have a dress and paint his lips? Yes, usually kids the answer. Uh, because it's like the horse who wants to be a dog, says in the book, she points out. You are as you are, and that's when you are the best. 
Now, you tell me that I am the extremist when I mention helicopters. Please, I dare you. Again, as said in the video about ideas having consequences, this is not something to take lightly. And the first to be blamed are the parents. They are the ones who tolerate this nonsense. And this is why, for some places, like Sweden or France, I sometimes think they're beyond the point of no return. Because it is not birth rates that fuck, fuck you over as a society. It's the total lack of reaction to bullcrap like this. In France, the Muslim parents held up high to get an education law essentially abolished because it contained sexual education of a similar kind that we're now seeing in Sweden. And they won. Sure, the militant Catholics and whatever other conservatives still exist in France helped too, but it was the Muslim parents who were the most visible and the most hardline and adamant about keeping this lunacy out of the curricula of their children. Because unlike basic Swedes and average Frenchmen, Muslims do want to live and thrive. They have the will to survive for another generation, with all the good and especially the bad that, that, in, that this entails. That's something everyone else needs to relearn. And for this kind of nonsense, the parents are the first to blame. Are you going to tell me that if 80 or 90% of the parents would have opposed this, they would have still pressed on it? Really? I mean, in Sweden, most schools are private in some way, shape or form. If 80% of children are withdrawn from that school, or kindergarten or whatever, that school goes bankrupt. It's really that simple. But the ignorance at best and agreement at worst by the parents to these ideas is what, is what keeps the show going. Because I'm sorry, you can't blame big government for everything. Yes, the policies are insane and the author of this book is a militant misandrist cunt from one of the most radical universities in Europe, I mean, Lund University is the second only to Uppsala University, which is also from Sweden, but none of this would have happened if you just stood up for your values and ultimately for the future of your child. So, there's that. Staying in the realm of education and activist ideologues fucking it up, but going across the North Sea in the United Kingdom, Coming from the Telegraph, mother calls for Sleeping Beauty to be banned from primary school as it promotes inappropriate behavior. It goes like this, quote, A mother has asked for Sleep Beauty to be removed from the, the classes of younger children at her son's primary school as it promotes inappropriate sexual behavior. Sarah Hall from no uh, Northumberland Park near Newcastle raised the issue after her six-year-old brought home a children's book version of the fairy tale. The mother of two said she was concerned about the message that the story where a prince kisses Sleeping Beauty to wake her from her cursed slumber sent younger children. However, she added that she felt the story should not be completely removed from the curriculum and could be used to start a conversation with older children around consent. Speaking to the Newcastle Chronicle, Miss Hall said, quote, I think it's a specific issue with the Sleeping Beauty story about sexual behavior and consent. It's about saying, it, is this still relevant? Is it appropriate? In today's society, isn't, it isn't appropriate. My son is only six, he absorbs everything he sees, and it isn't as if I can turn it into a constructive conversation. I don't think uh, taking Sleeping Beauty books out of uh, circulation completely would be right. I actually think it would be a great resource for older children. You could have a conversation around it. You could talk about consent and how the princess might feel. But I'm really concerned about it for younger children and would really welcome a conversation about whether this is suitable material. Okay, let's keep the part where they tell us what the Sleeping Beauty is. Uh, quote, the 40-year-old said she was partly prompted to take action over the uh, over book by the coverage of recent sexual harassment scandals. When tweeting about the book her son brought home, she used the MeToo hashtag, which thousands of women and men have used to share their experience of sexual harassment in the wake of the Harvey Weinstein scandal. The mother then left a comment in her son's record book and has since contacted the school to ask for the book to be removed from younger classes. Miss Hall added, quote, These are indicative of how, how ingrained that kind of behavior is in society. All these small things build up and they make a difference. I think it's a specific issue in the Sleeping Beauty story about sexual behavior and consent. It's about uh, saying, it, uh, is this still relevant? Is it appropriate? Close quote. Now, you know what the sad part is in this story? That this ludicrous position 
will be taken seriously. Because mind you, crazy ladies with stupid ideas about the curricula exist everywhere. A few months ago, a crappy teacher who could not promote her due exams was making waves here in Romania complaining about a literature book studied in the 8th grade, which she claimed promoted rape and domestic violence. The difference is that here she was treated with scorn, derision and eventually ignored altogether by the mainstream. Which is precisely the treatment that must be applied to ideologues of this kind. Not censorship, but derision and then shunning. They must have the right to spew their bullcrap, but not the right to impose their bullcrap on everyone else. I'm afraid in the United Kingdom things will go radically different. Why? Because unlike most of Europe, from what I observed, the United Kingdom has a bunch of busybody institutions that enforce ideology on schools, including private schools that are completely out of control and there's little to no room for the normal parents. I mean, there is that Ofsted institution, I think Ofsted is the name. If I'm wrong, I'll edit this part out. <laughs> anyway, there is this institution that has the legal means to force private Jewish schools to teach transgenderism to six-year-olds. Such level of insanity beats all of Europe combined. I mean, not even Germany, a place known to rigidly enforce ideological control over its education, not even Germany goes that far. And most of the rest of Europe, East or West, has various degrees of school autonomy and checks and balances in this department. But not the United Kingdom, apparently. I say apparently because I did not study every single educational guideline in the country, but I did look extensively at the practice. And the way things work in practice appear to take, take one to the conclusion that normal people stand no chance of maintaining some semblance of normality in their schools. Now, I wish I would have any idea on how to combat this on a practical politics level, but I don't. I honestly have no idea how to tackle this. If I were a parent in that situation, I would have moved my kids at a foreign school probably a long time ago. Alright, since we spoke almost exclusively about education, let's finish in the same note. Coming from um, Yahoo News, Girl Scouts warn parents about forcing kids to hug relatives on holidays. It's quite a long article, but I'll try to trim it. Uh, quote, Girl Scouts of the USA issued a warning to parents this holiday season, asking them to think twice before forcing their daughters to hug relatives at gatherings. Think of it this way, telling your child that she owes someone a hug, uh, either just because she hasn't seen that person in a while or because they gave her a gift, can set the stage for her questioning whether she owes another person any type of physical affection when they have brought her dinner or done something else seemingly nice for her later in life, reads the post on the Girl Scouts website. The organization's massive uh, missive to parents comes as allegations of sexual uh, misconduct by men out from every industry, including Hollywood, politics and the media. One in nine girls under the age of 18 experiences sexual abuse or assault at the hands of an adult, according to data shared by the Rape, Abuse and Incest uh, National Network, an anti-sexual assault organization. Now, it should be noted that the exact same organization also shares data that shows that one in ten sexual abuse or assault allegations are complete and utter lies. But you'll never see the cathedral media quoting them about that, mind you. Anyway, let's read further. Past research also suggests that nearly one in three episodes of sexual abuse of a child is perpetrated by a family member. The Girl Scouts post encourages parents to offer their daughters ways to show gratitude that do not require f a physical contact, including a smile, a high five, or even an air kiss. <laughs> Dr. Janet Taylor, a psychiatrist based in New York City and uh, Sarasota, Florida, said parents uh, should be careful not to create a mass hysteria about physical contact with loved ones, especially during the holiday season. As parents, we have to use common sense and also realize that it's never too early to start a conversation about a good touch and a bad touch, said Taylor. But we also don't want to overstep our boundaries, so our children are not afraid of who they should not be afraid of, she added. The awareness of unwanted contact that we have right now is needed. I just caution parents about limiting family attachment and that kind of loving space that a lot of time only happens at the holidays. The Girl Scouts membership includes 1.8 million girls, according to its website. It should again be noted that while Girl Scouts is still exclusively for girls, the equivalent Boy Scouts has been completely cucked and cowed into accepting girls. Because you see, 
Equality is good, provided that it ruins boys. Girls are saints. Anyway, carrying on. Quote, the post-titled reminder she doesn't owe anyone a hug, not even at the holidays, has been shared nearly 7,000 times on Facebook, where it was met with mixed reactions. Seriously, now even teaching our kids to show affection to family is basically child abuse, wrote one commentator. Unless something inappropriate is going on, this shouldn't even be a topic to discuss, and if that is the case, then that is entirely a different situation. This is right up there with giving out participation trophies. Ridiculous, wrote another. Teach your daughters to respect others and themselves, teach them to know the difference. If an adult is seriously offended by a child not feeling comfortable with a hug, they need to grow up, wrote a commenter in support of Girl Scouts post. Of course, we all want our kids to be loving and kind, but doing something that doesn't feel right to them just because an adult wants you to is wrong. No one should be compelled to touch anyone they don't want to, especially children, wrote another commentary support. It is her choice if she wants to give or receive touch, and we should respect that choice. And it goes on and on like that for a bit more, uh, with some rationalizations for this lunacy. Now, Allow me to tell you something very radical. <clears throat> Ready? No, it is not her choice if she wants to give or receive touch from a relative while in public at a family event. Sorry, that's just how families work. And I'm sure we can all see both sides of the argument here. I mean, we all had that overly touchy aunt or uncle who would kiss us on, as children, perhaps a bit too much. Maybe some of them had smelly breathing and whatnot. Or maybe uh, their gift wasn't so generous to be worth for us as kids to bear with them. I can definitely empathize with that. However, this is not reason enough to whip up kids, girls or boys, into sexual assault hysteria. Nor is it reason to accept or condone such insane proposition as to teach very young children to treat their eldest with suspicion that maybe there is a pedo behind every bush and also including at your Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving dinner, our Christmas dinner or whatever. That is an insane proposition and needs to be rejected. Good thing that Americans are, by and large, far smarter than this and fundamentally reject this nonsense, which is praiseworthy in and of itself, because in the 1980s, Americans fell, in, fell into a nationwide pedo hysteria. Those of you who are older may remember. So much damage, so, so big was the damage that uh, then, that thousands uh, of completely innocent people, both men and women, served very long jail terms for child abuse that never happened. It took 10 years, or sometimes more, until the supposed victims grew up and testified for those mistakes to be in some way uh, repaired. So in that sense, I'm very glad that it is now uh, much more widely rejected, or at the very least regarded with skepticism, instead of listen and believe. But let's get back to the radical statement that I made earlier, namely that it is not her choice if she wants to give or receive touch from a relative while in public at a family event. Here's the thing. Children are not little adults. Children are future adults. There is a difference. If they had been just little adults, then we should have given them the right to vote or let them drive since the age of 12, when most boys can definitely drive from a physical standpoint. But they're not little adults. Children need to be taught almost everything. And that includes how to be courteous, how to, yes, discriminate between family, friends, and complete strangers. And they also need to be taught how these things work. Let me give you an analogy. When you teach your kid, or even you yourself were taught back when you were a child, to say thank you, how did that go? Were your parents like, oh, it's his or her choice whether he says thank you or not? I honestly doubt that. What did happen was your parents, usually your mom, nagging you every time you got something with the question, what do you say when you receive something? And you would say, thank you, mister, or thank you, ma'am, or thank you, Uncle Joe, or whatever the ca case might have been. Later on in adulthood, you did start to discriminate, of course, and you would treat some things better than others, which is, of course, very normal. Well, a similar um, dynamic occurs here, too. A hug or other forms of minimal physical affection is very much needed and normative, even among not-so-functional families, but especially in functional families. Sure, the kid would be much more enthusiastic about hugging the favorite grandpa than about hugging some 
distant uh, aunt that uh, he or she knows almost nothing about. But still, to claim that grandpa saying, aren't you gonna give me a hug after giving your kid a car or a doll or whatever is somehow wrong, is to be an idiot. And Girl Scouts appeared to be run by idiots. Paranoid idiots at that. Because here's another thing. Kids get easily distracted, especially before the age of 8, and if you legitimately believe in this all choice ideology, you still have to remember that a kid might get immediately distracted by something else and simply forget to hug the grandpa, even if he or she wanted to do so. In addition to all of that, to claim that letting Auntie Katie or Uncle Joe kiss your daughter on the cheek for goodbye or for greeting after Uncle Joe hasn't seen her in years, to claim that that can be psychologically damaging, is to claim that the family itself is bad, which is in line with leftism, leftist militantism that runs amok uh, through all of these subverted institutions, but that doesn't make it true. As for the argument that this, quote, sets the stage for her questioning whether she owes another person any type of physical affection when they have bought her a dinner or done something else seemingly nice for her later in life, unquote, I say this, even if that were true, so what? No, seriously, so what? One should, man or woman, question whether one owes a hug or at least a handshake to someone who did something nice for him or her. That's called being a normal, decent human being. Human beings have been bonding non-sexually in similar manners for millennia. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. If these claims were to be taken seriously, what they're basically saying is that we should raise a generation of low-functioning aspies who can't even get the most basic social cues and act most of the time like they're soulless drones devoid of any empathy, decency, kindness and friendliness. Pretty much like Danish men, basically, or urban Swedish women. Cold as fuck in all interactions and, quite frankly, lifeless in many ways. It is, in my humble opinion, a crime against children to try to rob them of the formative experience of being and acting like being alive, at least from time to time. And to suggest this during holiday season, when it's really nice to be around other people and be a bit more joyful, that's just mean. And mind you, I say this as someone who is not particularly fond of holidays. I mean, I worked last Christmas, and it was by choice. I'll probably work this Christmas too, this time probably for this channel. I'll show you the Christmas fair of a Romanian city. But even if even I like to be a bit more joyful on certain holidays, and I'm a self-admitted mean extremist. Jesus Christ. These people, the leftists who think like this, these people legitimately give me the creeps. And it's hard to give me the creeps. Anyway, that's it for this episode. I think we have enough insanity for one podcast. Stay tuned, because a lot more of this is coming. I'm working almost around the clock to make new videos, even though I also have two trips scheduled in December. But you'll get some of some benefit from those too. No worries. Uh, okay. So with all of that being said, thank you all for watching. Thank you for your consistent and generous support. Please do subscribe to my social media. Links are in the low bar. And do consider throwing a shekel as well, because making these videos is not free. If you derive some value from this, and you can afford it, of course. So with that, I'll see you all soon on Freedom Alternative.